Um, so good morning, everybody. A uh, bunch of people just joining in now, which is always the norm here at 10.05 or so, 10.06. So appreciate your time for coming down and hanging out for a good hour. We're going to be doing some stereo uh, ideal. Uh, you can see here I brought up a nice little article, the difference between mono stereo surround binaural and 3D sound. But we're going to do a bunch of that working towards um, logic and using 3D audio, binaural uh, mixing, and potentially even getting to 5.1 surround sound which is quite interesting. So we'll get to that this week. Um, let me see what else, what else I get here. Uh, let's move this over here. Let's do this over here. We'll leave this up for a moment. We'll go back over here. So uh, yeah, um, I did get a bunch of grades in the last day or so. So thank you people for catching back up. Again, go back to your classwork, start at the top and just make sure everything is submitted. I'm pretty sure everything is categorized correctly. So the quizzes and the quizzes, the project projects, notebooks and notebooks. Yep. And project 12 is up. And again, project 12 is creating your LinkedIn and YouTube profile. We went over that yesterday. So again, if you have any, uh, I, um, sorry, any questions about that first, go back into the video on YouTube and check it out. And that way, uh, it's a full explanation of the entire scope of the project. So, you know, get a good look at that before you ask any other questions about it. I'm shutting down the Instagram video for the day and we're going to get started in just a moment. Before we do that, anybody have any questions about the class, project 12, project 11, anything about math or science integration, quizzes, anything at all in regards to that? You can see my uh, grade sheet is, is long. <laughs> going back to March 27th, there's been a lot of assignments. You can see as I scroll through this all, there's going to be a bunch of stuff there. So again, be sure that you are not finding yourself in June having to have to do all of that work in a week or two. It'll be a very daunting task. So all that work was assigned over the course of the last eight weeks. So please make sure that you're going back now and catching up if you haven't done so already. I think I have tendinitis in my thumb. I don't know what's going on with my thumb. No other questions. Awesome. So let's get into a little uh, stereo idealism. Uh, stereophonics, or people like to just call it sound. <laughs> um, I found this little chart. I don't use this exact one, but I have something very much like it that we hand out um, around this time in the class. Uh, we also deal with a little... Uh, sound for film, which we will try to touch on next week in logic, using logic with film. Anyway, um, this kind of is a precursor to that because then we really start thinking about how we're perceiving sound. One of the things about film, it really lends itself to you utilizing the left and the right speaker independently. Uh, things that move across the screen, as we know when we talked about this with Pro Tools, should follow along from left to right. Things that are happening, um, you know, far away should be low. Things that are happening very close should be um, much louder. Um, and also when you get into logic and start talking about um, the Z axis, the up and down, the vertical axis. So you get the horizontal, the vertical, and then the third dimension uh, to basically, as we showed you yesterday, uh, create perspective. You know, if you were walking down the street and a bird chirped, your ears are very good at kind of detecting where that chirping is from. Maybe it's not directly in front of you. Maybe it's up and to the left a little bit, all right? So how do your ears do that? Well, they start by using time as a mechanism to determine global positioning. So as the sound hits one ear earlier than the other, direct sound now, not reflected sound, not environmental sound, direct sound hits your left ear and hits your right ear sometime after, then that means that the sound is off to the left. Now, how do we determine height? How do we determine uh, distance? These are also designs of your ear that are very important. For instance, your pinea have a lot to do with the, Z, the vertical axis, the up and down. Um, and of course, your ears are shaped in a way where things that are directly in front are funneled in much faster than things are a little further up off axis further down off axis, even behind you. 
So your ears actually are blocking a little bit of the direct sound because of the shape of them, right? So when your brain perceives a sound that's behind you, it actually has a very distinct um, like code in it. Your, your brain is receiving it saying, oh, that's what it would be like if the sound wasn't completely direct, if it was off a little bit. And then again, using left and right ears, you can determine, is it back into the left or back into the right or whatever it might be. So these concepts have been used for hundreds of years, hundreds of years. Um, and not so much because we had the technology, just because we had the brain capacity to understand these concepts, right? Uh, since humans can hear and we've had uh, you know, great um, doctors that have kept our hearing very well tuned into the world around us, uh, we've been able to, you know, basically recreate these concepts using very basic, very basic technology. For instance, the phonograph. Okay. So the phonograph was a record player that had what looked like a big horn coming out of it. If anyone doesn't know what a phonograph is, we'll just type in phonograph and show you what a phonograph looked like. And there it is. Um, it's a record player and had a big horn, but we can still use the concepts. So, you know, looking at this, you could say it's monophonic, right? It's basically one sound coming out of here, whether there were two tracks or two distinct signals on the record or on whatever the device, mechanical recording device it is, the speaker, the horn is still one device. So it's really mono, monophonic. Um, and when we use to describe that concept, you know, we're really talking about not mono oral, we're talking about this guy right here in the middle here, this one right here, monophonic, right? One speaker in a room, playing out into the room, hitting both your ears roughly at the same time. You know, obviously if you're shifted off left and right from the speaker, it would be a little different. You just, your brain would know where the speaker was in the room. It's not so much that the sound coming out of it would change. And then we started um, working, you know, uh, later down the line after um, monophonic, when we had that first uh, AM radio and we were able to get a headset on that, we actually were going into mono oral. So mono oral is one ear with a headset directly into that one ear. This is kind of like what, you know, FBI use in their one ear. Huh? Red team go, red team go. Yeah, that's mono oral. But we're also talking about sound, not just, you know, communication here. We're talking about music. We're talking about um, talk radio or news radio or anything that could be played out of one ear. Back in the day, uh, if anyone's ever experienced a drive-in movie and you wanted to put a speaker into your car while watching the movie, you would get this box, it would hang on your door, and it'd be inside your car, and you'd be able to hear mono-orally the sound from the movie. <clears throat> so now, instead of going to a movie theater and experiencing two speakers in the front of the stage, you'd be experiencing it a little differently. So now the mixing engineers of this movie would have to create some sort of mono oral mix for the people that are doing it in drive throughs And listen, drive throughs were much more popular back in the day, much more popular than they are today. And maybe that will change now of the pandemic. I, I just blew my mind that the first thing that came out in the first, you know, within a month was what about driving movie theaters? Like, yeah, it makes sense. Um, but you can't leave your car to go to the bathroom then, right? I mean, things are a little less crazy now than they were at the height. But when they started talking about driving movies, I'm going, wow, man, driving movies theaters. And I went to one when I was a kid upstate. Um, and it's kind of cool. It's a cool experience. It's different. A um, couple things that are different, uh, you know, just because it was the, the 90s or I think maybe late 80s, there was actually more technology than there were back in the 40s, 50s, and 60s for drive-ins. Mm -hmm. And so you had speakers playing the sound out into the arena or into the field, and it was loud enough where you could still get the full experience. But going back into the early part of the 1900s here, you know, you didn't have that technology, those amplifiers and that power to send that signal through the field. So you would all have this box sitting right where the car would be. So again, uh, drive in movie. 
Theater. You can actually, I'll get you a picture of it so you can see. Um, Because a lot of people don't realize, you know, what things used to be. So if you take a look at this, um, you know, there's this little pole here. This little pole actually would be where you would have the speaker. Um, and you could actually pull it off the pole with the wire and send it into your car. Um, obviously, a lot of these pictures of more recent drive-in movie theaters. Um, so if you can see, it, it's actually a really cool concept here. Uh, but the oldie time ones, and here, here's a great example. So there's your speaker, right? The pole would be sitting there. You'd pull up next to it. You could actually take this speaker off of the pole with the wire and put it into your car. And then you could close your car window and stay warm if it's too cold or stay cool if it's too hot. And, you know, basically listen to the movie. And that is a example of mono oral, this type of monitoring. It's different than monophonic. All right. Yesterday, we actually spoke very briefly about binaural, where we talked about using a quote unquote dummy head. Yes, it is actually a dummy head to pre mix your stereo sound. All right. Again, let's just touch on stereo. We know what stereo is, right? Two speakers, two distinct signals, a left and a right. And those two signals come out of independent speakers the left one to the left speaker and the right signal to the right speaker. It would play out of an environment, in an environment, and your ears would pick up the stereo sound. And there'd be some crosstalk, right? There'll be some crosstalk where the left signal does hit the right ear and the right signal does hit the left ear. If you want to go true, true left and right, hard, hard stereo sound, you're going to be in the biphonic range, all right? If you look at it down here. So biphonics is what you guys are very used to nowadays. Biphonic is the new normal because you're plugging in your headphones, your earbuds, and you're getting two distinct signals with no crosstalk, no environmental signal changes. You're getting true to what is a headphone mix. So biphonic means the left ear goes directly to the left ear with no crosstalk. There's no signal that crosses from the left over to the right at all. That's different than stereophonic because we're playing it out loud. So this signal that happens in the left ear of a stereophonic sound will eventually hit the right ear. It just will take a little longer, right? The time difference as we talked about yesterday. And the right signal will take a little time, but it will eventually cross talk to the left ear. So you're not getting that direct left and right signal in the stereophonic range. I mean, stereophonics have been the thing since the 1960s. I would even go far as back to say it was experimented with in the 40s. But today, we are way more inept. In a, I'm sorry, inept. That means that's a negative thing, by the way. We are way more adapted to the biphonic mixes that we hear in our headphones because we're all in our own world. We all have our earbuds. We all have our headphones. We're all listening it in those direct left-to-left -left and right-to-right -right comparison. Let's talk a little bit about some of the other things you see here. So, oh, by the way, let's go back to binaural. Now that we touched on stereophonics, we went over to biphonics, and now let's talk about binaural. Bi means two, right? So you're still going to have two independent speakers driving your headphones, all right? But the thing is, a dummy head was used up front to mix the two signals together. So you started out like biphonic over here. You started out with independent left and right. But these two signals here mix together through a dummy head, through a medium. I mean, they call it a dummy head. It's not really gets mixed through a, someone's dummy head. But it gets mixed down. This is what, what I was talking about when we decided, discussed yesterday about mono mixing. And I know we're going to now jump out of bi and stereo and talk about mono. But that's what mono mixing is. It took a signal from the left. It took a signal from the right, it mixed the two together, and then it took that one signal that was mixed together and split it out directly to your left and right ears. So technically speaking, when we are in mono mix on a Zoom, we are actually creating binaural signaling. And this is very, very popular. This is what was used very early on to get that stereo effect. It didn't give it a good one. It wasn't great. but it was closer than anything we had before that. 
Then we finally got into stereophonic sound. And then, of course, like I said today, we're using biphonics. So let's now take a look at some of the other ones that are here. I think people are dropping out of the class and jumping back in. All right. So um, we did already discuss mono oral, right? One signal to one ear up close. We did discuss monophonic, which is early on one speaker in an environment hitting both the left and right ears, one signal coming out. Let's take a look at this guy, the pseudophonic. This is a relatively new concept. Um, I have used this technology to check to see if it works better. Let me explain what I mean by that. When I'm mixing drums, all right, so I'm mixing drums, I will put the snare and the kick kind of in the center a little bit, but then my cymbals will be panned out left and right. So when you're listening to them in headphones or out of speakers, they feel like they're coming out of different areas, right? The concept is to recreate the experience as if you were the audience very close up against the drums, which also means then as I hit the snare around the toms down to the floor tom, I should feel like the toms roll around the stereo field from left to right. So for a right-hand drummer, for a drummer that's hitting the snare with his left hand, even though he's a righty, he's hitting the snare with his left hand mostly. When you do a tom roll down the bottom, the audience will experience it from right to left. Tom, the high tom would start off on the right ear and it would roll around all the way down to the floor to the left ear. That's the way it would work. Now, if we wanted to switch that and give a very kind of surprising perspective, we can actually switch left and right. Now, I wouldn't do this on each track. I would still mix it the way I'm doing it for my drums, right? Tom's left to right or right to left, if you think of it that way. But when I get to my drum sub, I might flip-flop left and right and see how that works within the mix. Sometimes, and I know if you paid attention enough to anybody that listens to, to rock music, sometimes you can actually hear whether they did a pseudophonic uh, flip, a biphonic cross-connected. Sometimes that cross-connected also can produce a little leak from one channel, one signal on the left or the right, over to the other one. Extremely interesting ways of doing things. It's a very, very, um, let's say, forward-thinking way and getting different elements to make different sounds across the stereo field. This is used more now today as a more creative and developed uh, ways of mixing for biphonic and stereophonic signals. So there is that. And then how about this one over here, this transoral? Two speakers with crosstalk cancellation. So in this method, we're actually going to let them crosstalk. We're going to let them interfere with each other. But instead of that interference creating more in the mix, that interference is going to create cancellation. And we're going to do that using phase. Again, why do we discuss phase and phase flipping and all that stuff at the beginning of the year? Because when we get to the point of the year where we're talking about higher level concepts, phase becomes a tool we can use to create different perspectives. In stereo signaling, what we can do is we make a copy of the left. So we have two lefts. So signal one is twice. Signal two is twice. Then we take one instance of each side, cross talk it to the other, and flip the phase to cancel it out. There is defining changes made when you listen to a mix that has done this. So there are plenty of ways that we can manipulate stereo sound, mono sound, multiple versions with mixing. I mean, I'm sure it just took some, you know, really bored dude or woman mixing something to figure this out. That if I took two a copy of each signal on the left hand and right side and bled it to the other and flip the phase, you can get some really cool results and you can. Let's take a look at my, uh, my article that I found here for us and the difference between uh, mono stereo surround binaural and 3D. So 3D is kind of what we're using nowadays for uh, VR. We're kind of using that concept and th there's actually something we're going to look at here that 
is showing what uh, certain manufacturers are using to create 3D sound. Um, I have one of these devices. They're really very cool. It's the ability to capture what amounts to 3D sound to match 3D video. So if you ever went on um, any of the social media that now has 3D enabled, or if you've been on to YouTube and you've gone on to some of these 3D environments or using some sort of VR with the cardboard uh, VR mask or where it's really starting to become hugely popular, obviously, is in gaming. So now creating mixes with 3D sound is really important. Um, and we are. We're in the midst of a renaissance, as this article says. And, and just like I was stating before, iPhones all now come with stereo speakers, right? Every single oh, one. Yo, what's up? Yo, isn't there like 4D, 5D? Well, it's more like surround sound, if you're talking about regardless of that. Uh, are we talking about video, 4D, 5D? Not like in music. There's like... Yeah, you know, I mean, there really is no more than just, you know, your X, Y, and Z axes, left and right, up and down, front and back. That's pretty much it. And then you manipulate those three axes to develop sound in complete dimension around you. Um, when you want to go up to four or five, you know, all that stuff, now we're talking more along the lines of surround sound. And surround sound right now, the most common is, uh, a simple horizontal uh, line. So you'd be sitting in a space, in front of you is two speakers, behind you, I'm sorry, in front of you is three speakers, left, right, and center. Behind you is two speakers, left and right. And on the floor is a sub to handle all the low end. Um, now, as we, and I'll, I'm gonna show you this uh, video later in the week, uh, we have Atmos Sound. Atmos, Dolby Atmos created this ridiculous array so now not only do you have that horizontal line around you to show really hard left and right movement, but now you have a line of speakers above your head that flies through the um, x-axis. Um, and then you also have ones that are just off of that. So we can actually create almost a three-dimensional uh, sphere around us and create sound moving through that sphere and give people a much different experience. So... Yeah, that requires a heck of a lot of technology and a lot of different kinds of mixing. Um, but you'll see when we get to the video later in the week about Atmos Sound, you'll see how in-depth that is. Now, nobody at their home with a PS4 or an Xbox or whatever you're using is going to have Atmos Sound in their basement, right? I mean, that's crazy. You might have at most 10.1. Most people are wearing headphones. And no headphones are equipped to do that kind of sound. So we're going to rely mostly nowadays on 3D sound. Um, and we're going to look at that right now and what 3D sound means to our you know, basic technology today. But we can actually go to places that have spent millions and millions of dollars on these huge arrays, but you really just can't do gaming that way. And honestly, the gaming community is not outfitted for that right now because the easiest way is pop on a set of headphones and play your game. So what I was saying before is that, you know, the iPhones themselves actually have stereo speakers now, right? One in the top, one in the bottom. So you can get really good stereo sounds. And of course, Bluetooth headphones, uh, AirPods, and uh, many other companies that create them now create this really great uh, bi, um, sorry, biphonic sound right here, biphonic. So that's pretty much what most of us are working in. Also, again, if you're gaming and you have, a set of headphones on, uh, you're working in biphonic sound. When you hear things happen off to the right or the left, right, you're actually hearing it off to the right or left and it immediately tells your brain, you got to look off to the right or the left. It's happening over there in front of you versus behind you, that kind of stuff. They're actually doing a really good job in gaming to give you a very basic three-dimensional uh, sphere, but you're only using two signals to do that. Um, yeah, yeah, obviously, you know, podcast, blah, blah, blah. Uh, the rise of virtual reality has uh, both brought binaural audio and a century-old audio format back to spotlight introduced now as 3D sound. And this is why it's extremely important to understand the differences in this because as a mixing engineer, you might have to mix in one of these formats specifically for a song, a movie, a game, or whatever it is you're going to do with it. So we really mostly work in stereophonic to start um, interviews, radio, television, that kind of stuff. But yo. 
um can you leave like an article on like the binaural and like the one up here binaural 21st century no the um the one with the stereos with the headphones you were saying like you were talking about it earlier it's like with the uh, head it's got headphones oh, the dummy head it. yeah yeah yeah, yeah. All right. we had that we covered it yesterday but i'm gonna get to that it's gonna be down here as we go along okay so um you know the we, like i said i always like to start out very basic you know the concept it's mono we know mono as our microphone inputs one signal one side if you didn't have mono mix plugged in or turned on to the zoom you'd only hear your voice on the left hand side that is strictly mono when we set up an audio channel in our software to record a vocal track to record a guitar track we are using mono signals it is the most widely used format out there it's a single channel with a single signal um, and what you're basically doing is it's only going to happen in one earbud and unless you mix the two together, like we do in the software by creating a mono track, but sending the mono track to the master, you're not going to hear it in both ears. It, your iPhone is built to capture mono sound, right? You, the, the fact that you pick up a phone and you call somebody, it's mono sound. Now, by the time it reaches the other person and hits both their ears, if you're listening to it in earbuds, now it's become binaural sound, right? Binaural is the mixing together like right here, of a mono signal from, your, from one person's cell phone to something else, which is nothing, mix it together, and then send it out to both ears. It's a great example of binaural mixing is a, a cell phone call from one person's Bluetooth headset to another person's Bluetooth headset. Then we jumped into stereo. This is just a natural progression of the way the industry has worked. We experimented a lot with monaural and monophonic, and then we started working in stereophonic or stereo where we have two independent channels, two localized audio sources, signal one on the left, signal two on the right. Most mu music you listen to on Spotify or shows you watch on Netflix have been mixed into stereo so that the drums have been mixed to the right or a sense of character walking from left and right of the screen. And then you actually hear that, right? You actually hear the drums roll across from left to right. You actually hear the car pass from left to right. All right. And most of that is being experienced stereophonically. Out of your television, you do have defining left and right speakers. You're getting a very small concept of how sound traveled from left to right. A lot of it is not coming biphonically. It's not happening here. If we had a set of headphones plugged directly into the mix of a movie, we'd probably hear it a lot more def definitively when the car passes from left to right. But instead, as we listen to music out of speakers or we watch stuff on TV, this is what's going on. And I even mentioned things like, you know, Alexa and our, um, our smart speakers. Those all have that same concept. It's stereo sound, but it's so close together, you don't get the huge sense you would when you were biphonically. Then we have surround sound, and this is what we were kind of describing before. This is now multiple speakers using multiple signals and different speakers to kind of create that final experience. So you're going to take a program mix, and once you created a uh, stereo mix, you're going to make some of the stuff that's in that stereo mix stand out more now by putting it in other speakers, directing it, uh, sending the signals to. We'll again, we'll talk about this when I finally get to surround sound in logic later this week. Uh, surround sound systems are 5.1. I had a 5.1 system in my room uh, when I was probably 13 years old. So it's been around quite some time. Um, was it the best 5.1? No. Did the television give me 5.1? Not really. It was kind of like a, a faux, F-A-U-X, a faux, -A -A uh, faux 5.1. But it was still kind of cool because you got a sense more of sound all around you. Um, actually it's gone up to uh 21 to one now, which is ridiculous because once you get beyond, let's say 10, one, I'm sorry, seven, one or 10, two, um, now you're talking about Atmos and Atmos is just ridiculous where the whole room is speakers and you could put something anywhere. You want to put something on a, uh, horizontal plane, uh, about 10 feet above your head. You can do that. So when you start messing around with this kind of stuff, it really starts getting uh, obviously way more expensive, but again, a lot more to worry about where 
and a lot more detailed in the sound that's being played through. Of course, binaural sound, as we said, is an upgrade from stereo, which you're getting direct left and right signal. Again, just to reiterate, binaural um, was an upgrade from stereo. It was the next evolution from um, what we had in stereophonics. Um, we're, now we're able to still take two channels. Um, and there is a cool little link here that you can get and click on that actually brings you to examples of it and gives you more description. So some of these signals are binaural signals, but it does say you should probably use headphones. Um, and so you're not gonna, whoops, you're not gonna get the experience that we were, what we, we, what I would want for you with, um, with that. It would be kind of silly, you know, to, to try to play that out right now. And uh, uh, where is this? I'll go back to this. Nope. This is not where I was. Where was I? Earlier today, where was I? Complete list of everywhere. Oh, yeah. Well, this one's good. Okay, so we did mono. We did stereo, surround, binaural. Like I said, uh, if you want to play the example, uh, definitely click on this link and then throw some headphones on to your phone or to your laptop. And now let's talk a little bit about 3D audio. All right. And this is where we at one time had the technology for this a century ago. And we stopped using it because we became very reliant on stereophonic and binaural sound. So today it's kind of coming back to light because of what we're able to do with video now and do virtual reality. And this comes down to experiences in education where I've done a virtual reality recording for an educational institution. Um, and it's uh, very cool the way they shoot it. And it gives you an awesome experience. If you go online, my, even my kids are going through virtual reality um, places in the world to visit and pretend like they're there. And I have actually a VR uh, headset myself as well. Um, and of course, gaming. Gaming's a big deal. So uh, virtual reality has brought about this format in, for the VR experiences. And 3D audio can be created in a bunch of different ways, obviously, in a computer, where you're going to be basically creating sound sources in an environment, um, where you're going to explore the environment, so things are going to change as you walk through that environment. Um, or if you're capturing live action, you want to use basic binaural or ambisonic mic, which I have an ambisonic mic. And then you're going to take that ambisonic information and embed it into the mix it gives you a really great idea of how it works. So let me just show you this because this was interesting. I felt like, oh, Markham won't let me show the, stop it. There we go. Let's uh, go open and open this image in this tab. So it's nice and big for you. And there you go. A nice little chart about what is 3D audio and how can you get it and how it's made and how these um, engineers and or uh, microphone based uh, companies create these really cool, like exotic looking things. And they try to charge you a million dollars for these things. And look, it's just way too much money. It actually has come down tremendously. And I know if you saw in the previous slide that it said updated monthly, it's not, I'll be honest with you. It's really not this, this stuff has all been dropped down in price since it started. And you can see that there's some big players in the game. Um, this one right here, this Terra mic, uh, Tetra mic, sorry, Tetra mic. This thing now you can get from Zoom. Zoom actually makes a VR mic now. And if we look at Sweetwater, uh, we'll go into uh, Zoom VR and let's see what Zoom has created. And look at that. Magic. Does that look like a million dollars to you? Nope. So let's kind of take a look at this uh, because this is the one I have. This is the H3 VR. It's uh, very simple. You put it on a mic stand and you have one, two, three, four different microphones recording sound. And because of the way the integration of the four tracks work, you're able to actually capture this really cool surround sound image 
without going crazy. And it's a four track as opposed to a two track, but then it can get folded down into two tracks and used for 3D audio. So um, the application of this is actually really easy. So you can see here, look, four, four tracks by two, which means you're gonna record four signals, but you're gonna go down to two, or you can record two signals that are gonna go down to two. The sample rate bit rate is really good. And you can play back all four independently and change the way they're mixed. So like A, B, C, and D. If I want A and C to be one track and B and D to be the other, you can do that. Um, but it is in an ambisonic array, which means that it's pointed in the right direction to create ambisonic sound. And let's see if we can find a little bit of background on this because this is a really cool device. Introducing the Zoom H3 VR Virtual Reality Audio Recorder. The only recorder that can capture and decode spatial audio all in one device. Its four capsule ambisonics mic captures four channels of 360 degree audio up to 24 bit 96K. The onboard decoder automatically converts the raw ambisonics A audio to VR ready ambisonics B audio so it can easily be paired with your 360 video, and no computer is required. Boom. When shooting a 360 degree video, staying out of the shot can be tricky, which is why the H3 VR can be activated remotely via the H3 VR control app. Operate the transport controls, adjust levels, and enter the metadata notes right from your iOS device. Creators can monitor their audio while recording. And with onboard Ambisonics playback, you can rotate the H3 VR to simulate spatial audio while listening. The H3 VR is built with a six axis motion sensor for auto mic position and level detection. So whether your mic is right side up, upside down, or on its side, your audio and video orientations will stay aligned. The Zoom H3 VR enables creators of all levels to capture 360 audio for VR, AR, and mixed reality content. Great visuals put you into the world. Great audio makes you believe it. Tagline. So yes, this is one of those devices that uh, obviously as the Industry has changed. Many manufacturers have created these types of devices in order to compete in that market. Um, and this one is actually very cool and it's really, really very useful. Um, great way of, again, capturing that ambisonic or spatial audio as they were calling it. You could see how they break down the grid here from left, right, front, back, again, X, Y axis. And then you're able to take that information and then build it in. And look, if you look at this, this ambisonic mic here, um, yeah, it has pretty much the same concept. Four different capsules positioned in very specific places. Uh, Rode also makes a VR, I believe. And that one's not very expensive either. Uh, let's see, Rode VR. And I think there's actually uh, Zoom AKG. Uh, maybe it's not, they won't call it a VR. But yeah, um, there's you know a bunch of different microphone companies that have jumped into the market because of the popularity of, you know, three-dimensional shooting, virtual reality, um, and gaming, and, and translating that information into gaming. Um, let me just type in ambisonic. Maybe that's an ambisonic. And hey, there's a bunch of them out there, right? Oh, Rhodes is $1,000. Of course it is. Um, and then this one, the Sennheiser one, actually, you probably can't see the capsules in there. But hmm, if I had to choose between this one, this one, and this one, I'm going to go with this one because it's the one that can be very affordable and does pretty much the exact same thing. I don't really see um, any interface on this. So you'd have to do all of that um, ambisonic post mixing with a piece of software, whereas the Zoom actually can do it internally for you. Um, I would say, you know, obviously because of the shape and design, it is hard to hide. Can't really mount it on anything uh, easily, but you know, there are certain benefits and cost benefits, obviously to that. So you have to really kind of weigh the differences out when you're working with um, some of these devices. And, and for me, you know, it's about, can I get the job done? Is the sample rate right? Does the 
technology hold up and is it affordable? And especially if I'm not going to make an entire living off of one microphone, why dump all of your resources into it, right? So if you're capturing live action video, you'll want to use a binaural or ambisonic mic and then the computer program to burn that audio to VR. Well, not if you're using the Zoom one. The Zoom will actually do that for you. As the sound moves around the environment, you're going to want to be able to follow that. So a lot of different um, concepts here to kind of soak in. Things like binaural and 3D audio really have created um, very, very different categories for where music engineers and sound engineers can kind of come together and put together something that's, again, a recreation of an exact moment in time. And that's the point of filmmaking or that's the point of VR. You want to make the audience member feel like they were there. And sometimes that's difficult using what we have here. A monooral or a monophonic system, definitely not something that can translate well into exact representation. Binaural, you're already mixing left and right together, so you've ruined the true experience. Stereophonic is better, but again, you're getting crosstalk left and right. Sound is coming off and hitting the right ear, but then hitting the left ear later. Transoral is good because you can sort of manipulate the crosstalk a little bit. That's what the cancellation is all about. But again, not exact. Um, we didn't talk about near phones. And this is interesting. So near phones, uh, I'm going to say, is if anyone had a gaming chair, yeah, if you've seen these, a gaming chair, where the speakers are built into the chair, you're not wearing headphones you're actually sitting in something where the speakers are very, very, very close to your ears, but not on them, where you still are getting a little bit of that stereophonic idea where there's crosstalk left and right, but it's not as bad. You are getting independent, just like biphonic, you are getting independent left channel, very close to your ear, independent right channel, very close to your ear, but they're not on your ears like headphones would be. All right, so this is like for biphonics, um, you're getting direct signal, no crosstalk, no environmental sound, no nothing. Here is a little different. And I'll give you an idea of that. Um, and we'll do the gaming chair idea. Gaming chair, uh, near field uh, speakers. There we go. So let's see if we got that. So I think some of these, like this is ridiculous. Actually, it's not even that expensive. Um, that has massage in it. I don't want massage. Dun, 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 dun. Yeah, some of the racing games really do well with this because it can actually vibrate the chair a little bit, which is kind of cool. Uh, dun, dun, nope, it's not doing that. And how does it vibrate the chair? Low frequencies. Uh, let me go back to here. Uh, near phones, that's what I was looking for. Near phones, uh, chair gaming. Sometimes it's hard to find all of the, um, the things. Eh, it's not showing me that. Oh, wait. Uh, headphone jack. That doesn't help. No. Some of us have those. I don't. I'm not a big gamer. I've played some games, but I'm not a big gamer. I'd rather just play, you know, Super Smash Brothers on the Wii, and I'll be good. Um, let's just see if this. Forget about sharing gaming. Let's just see near phones. Huh. Interesting. Ah, uh, proximoral. Okay, yeah. I mean, this is kind of cool concept here. This is actually from the AES Society. Interesting little discussion about this. Um, I do not want to purchase anything, and I can't get further than that, but that's interesting. And I'm not logged in, so that's probably why I can't see it either. Let's see what uh, computer designing. Let's see what they say about this. Oh, this is not funny at all. All right, we're done with that. Um, but yeah, I mean, the, the concept is there that you were really not 100% up against your ears. So there's a small amount of crosstalk happening here in the near phones. Um, but at the same time, you're getting close to biphonic sound, but you're not quite there. And then, of course, we said we had biphonic sound. And then the pseudo, which basically is direct signal to both ears with headphones. But there is a little crosstalk that happens here that allows a little bit of the left and right to squeak in. 
kind of giving you that stereophonic experience. And again, why would you choose one over the other? Well, it depends on what kind of um, you know, experience you want to give the audience member. That's, that's really the biggest thing. Um, and so then how do we record this? And then how do we eventually get that into the software? And this is where today into tomorrow is going to kind of start to take root and, and transfer. So we typically use a field recorder. I mean, for us, a field recorder is the way to go, right? We're, here's a Zoom. We're going to record it in the field. And I'm not going to listen to this. We're just going to kind of play along. But the concept is that if I take a Zoom with the front um, XY speakers, and I want to create this quote unquote uh, bi binaural um, experience or 3D audio, um, that's something you can do. And just using it with the line, you say you're going to use a mic with your headphones, built in stereo, record on. You know, it, in this case, this Zoom does not have a plugged in microphone, right? It does not have an XLR jack. So they're actually using the speaker from a headphone to actually do it. Yuck, bad example. I don't like that one. Um, we can do it on an iPhone. Uh, we know that there are a bunch of different um, interfaces out there for iPhones, believe it or not. If you guys are looking for um, XLR interface for iPhone, this is a, a cheap way that you can actually plug in uh, a real mic to your iPhone and record directly to your phone. Zoom makes one for um, 100 bucks. I had one of these, um, the iRig I do have, actually. I have an iRig right here in my bag. Actually, I have two different iRigs, uh, but they're not microphone iRigs. They're guitar and bass iRigs, and I use it to actually do a phone recording when I do live radio. Um, of course, Pro Tools Logic allows us to do this, um, and so, you know, they're going to, are they really going to use that stupid <laughs> uh, headset again? That's silly. Um, there's other ways. I don't know if you guys realize and, and stop me if I'm wrong. If you don't have software, if you didn't have software to do any editing with or record with, you could have just used zoom. You do know that zoom allows you to record. How do we record our, our, our classes every day? I'm using zoom to record the audio and the video. Yes, I have a microphone and yes, I have an interface and blah, blah, blah. It doesn't matter if I had the, the front part of my computer speakers, uh, computer microphone, it would have worked fine. It's just a matter of something to record in. Zoom actually lets you do it. So if you're searching for a way to actually record outside of your phone, that would have been a way to do it. You could use Zoom to record. Dump the video in the software or dump the video or go into QuickTime, export it as audio only. There are lots of ways and lots of resources out there right now that we can do our recordings with. So again, uh, and by the way, let's think about this for a minute. If I'm recording through my laptop microphone into Zoom, which one of these would it be? Think about that for just a moment. Which one of, they, which one of these would it be? If I was recording with my microphone into Zoom and then heard it back, which one of these would accurately represent a Zoom recording and a playback and how would that environment work? I mean, you're hearing it from me right now. Is it coming only in your left ear? Who's the dummy head in this particular signal path? Interesting, correct? Let's go through the signal path. My microphone into my interface, into my computer. Someone, somewhere along the line, is taking my one signal, mixing it with something else, which is probably nothing. And then when it gets to you finally through Zoom, it's coming out of both speakers. It's both speakers of a laptop, the stereo speakers of an iPhone, your left and right earbuds or headphones. Right now, right now, we are in the midst of binaural presentation. There is a dummy head that took my one signal and split it out to both of your headphones. But who was the dummy head? Which one 
which thing in that signal path I just described mixed it down? Was it the computer? Was it Zoom? Or was it your phone or device on your side that did it? That's an interesting, interesting concept. Yeah. Along the path, which one did it? I mean, I know. I'm not, I mean, I'm also kind of just throwing it out there. I'm not really asking for an answer right now. We can get to that later. But I, I want you to think about that. Where did the signal change? Obviously, it wasn't my mic because my mic has nothing in it except for an XLR out. Did it happen at the focus right? Did it happen at the computer? Did it happen at Zoom? Did it happen when it got to you? Hmm. Interesting, interesting things. All right. If no one has any questions for today, we are going to tomorrow start to translate all of this information that we learned yesterday and today into our software and how we're going to use it to create, to mix, to create multiple versions of mixes in order to adapt to certain environments. Um, I don't think we'll be able to do much VR work, uh, but I definitely have surround sound capability. And I definitely have um, binaural and stereophonic capability. So we're going to explore all of that as well as maybe a little bit of 3D sound in Logic Pro X. So again, I appreciate everyone for coming down today. If you have any questions uh, throughout a day, don't be afraid to uh, shoot me a text. I'm sorry, a text. You don't have my phone number, nor will you. Shoot me an email. Um, and let me know if you have any of those questions. I keep my laptop open pretty much all day. Also, uh, again, make sure you're going back through your classwork and complete everything that you have not completed yet. You don't want to be sitting here in June finding out that you may not graduate or may not move on to the next um, grade because you haven't done any work in this class and failing this class keeps you back, and that's a terrible place to be. Boy, that would suck as being your last hurrah in June after everything else, and then you're finding out, you haven't really done anything, and it's now catching up to you. Yuck. All right, folks. Well, I appreciate your time. We will see you guys tomorrow, 10 o'clock a.m., where we continue on our stereophonic journey. Later.